Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is Mitch Hatfield. I'm a senior conservation biologist uh, at the Xerce Society. I'm based in Portland, Oregon. I direct our bumblebee conservation programs. Uh, I run the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas Project in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, which launched in 2018. And then I'm also helping to coordinate the, the California Bumblebee Atlas Project. We'll be doing some work on the ground there. And then I also work um, in the Great Plains in North Dakota, down through Kansas, and including um, Missouri and um, Minnesota, actually. We were running Atlas projects there as well, and I'm helping to coordinate those projects with other Xerce Society staff members. <clears throat> so thanks for spending your um, Saturday morning with us. And uh, I'm gonna get started talking about sort of, a, Leaf has painted a picture for you of bumblebee ecology and sort of hopefully you have some idea of what these animals are or a better idea when we started. I'm now going to sort of talking about what we know about their, the conservation status of bumblebees to sort of lay the groundwork for why we might be doing a project like this in the state of California. So I'm going to be talking some about sort of what we know about their status, as well as what we think the threats are for some of the species that seem to be in decline. And then also talk about what the Xerces Society is doing about this, as well as potentially what all of you could be doing um, at your homes and your work, et cetera, et cetera. So, Leaf has given me essentially the distinguished um, job today of, of depressing you all. <laughs> he gets to talk about all the fun things and I get to talk about all of the, all the threats and, and depressing parts of this. And I, I say this in jest, there's, um, you know, obviously this will be a, a somewhat depressing module, but we will end on a hopeful note with all of the positive things I think that can be done with bumblebee conservation. I think that's one of the really nice things is that we, can do something about this if we work together and make a concerted effort to do that. So we've moved through um, our introduction to ecology. We're now gonna talk about bumblebee conservation. Leaf showed you this slide um, in his module as well. You know, why invertebrates? Um, you know, he mentioned that not only are invertebrates incredibly biodiverse, but they're also, you know, doing incredible ecosystem function. They're, they're decomposing, they're conducting biocontrol, and reducing the need for pesticides in our farm fields and gardens. They're feeding everything from fish and songbirds all the way up to grizzly bears, both directly and indirectly. And then they're doing all of these pollination services that we've mentioned in module one as well. So they're also feeding the world by producing the food that we eat. One out of three bites of food that humans put into our mouths came from a plant that was pollinated by a bee. And the same is true for most wildlife, you know, grizzly bears, black bears. Um, deer, um, to a certain degree, are eating plants that were pollinated by bees. And, and so these are obviously important animals well beyond what we might expect by just seeing them fly through a field. And, and Leaf mentioned that makes them keystone species. So uh, invertebrates are incredibly important. And when we start looking at sort of the status of invertebrates in the world, um, things get kind of scary. Um, there's a lot of studies going on. There's been, you know, headline stories in the New York Times um, about this, but a lot of these large scale studies that have taken place over the last 10 to 15 years have showed really dramatic declines in invertebrates. And it doesn't really matter how we look at um, these studies, whether we're looking at biomass or species richness or diversity, we're seeing really large declines, including um, some studies that are mentioned on this page here, there was a study that was done in Germany that was published in 2017 that showed a 70% decrease in insect biomass. <clears throat> and you may be asking yourself, why do I care about insect biomass? <laughs> you know, fewer insects maybe sounds like a good thing. Um, but when we think about all of the songbirds that are eating insects and other invertebrates, Biomass is essentially the food chain. It is what is feeding those animals. And so if you are seeing a 70% decrease in insect biomass, that's gonna cascade up the food chain. It's gonna directly affect songbirds and other animals that are, that are feeding insects. Likewise, here in, in the United States, we saw a 50% um, biomass decrease in mayflies. Um, obviously this is gonna affect our fish populations um, and, and uh, you know, cascade up the food chain as well. And then uh, abundance of, of aquatic insects declined by 45% in, in Ghana. So some really dramatic, those are large numbers. 
we're not talking about um, you know a slight decline or a potential decline. We're talking about you know huge decreases in insect biomass and abundance. And you know a lot of people say that you can also just test this yourself if, if you're sort of over the age of. 50 or so, and you've been driving a car for a long time, you probably remember back in the 80s, we could drive a car and at the end of your trip, particularly at night, your windshield would actually be covered in, in insects and in dead insects. And that does not happen to the same degree now that it used to, you know, 30 years ago. So there's, this is certainly something that we can sort of test. I'm sure some of that has to do with impro improved aerodynamics of automobiles, but but also just the reduced number of insects that are flying around our environment anymore. And this is sort of, biomass is obviously looking at a very large group of insects or, or invertebrates, but when we look at individual groups, we're seeing the same thing. There are dramatic declines in a number of bumble or butterfly species in the UK, global, we're seeing huge declines in monarch butterflies, particularly the Western population has decreased by more than 90% over the last 30 years um, has been petitioned for endangered species listing. So we're not talking about sort of small endemic animals here. We're talking about broadly distributed, once super common animals that are in you know, severe decline. Same thing with tiger beetles. Um, a third of tiger beetle species in, in the US are, are rare or threatened and on the, on the verge of, of extinction. And same thing with aquatic species, our freshwater mussels which are responsible for filtering our, our, our water and helping to create you know, clean, fresh, fresh water are also in dramatic decline. We're seeing huge die-offs. A species uh, in the West here has been petitioned for endangered species listing. Um, so yeah, we're, you know, things are grim when we look at the status of invertebrates uh, across the world. And this is also true, of course, of, of our bumblebees. And the conservation tale of bumblebees um, in North America really begins with these four species. There was a, a gentleman by the name of Robin Thorpe, um, who was a, a long-term professor at UC Davis, and then a professor emeritus at UC Davis, who has deceased, unfortunately, at a big loss to the bumblebee conservation community, who was doing research um, on the Western bumblebee and Franklin's bumblebee, the two species that you see on the left-hand side of the slide in Northern California and in Southern Oregon. And he was, in the course of his research surveys, those species essentially disappeared um, over the course of uh, two or three years. And at that time, he sort of waved the red flag and said, hey, I'm seeing some fairly dramatic declines in, in bumblebees here in the West. What are you seeing in, the, in other parts of the country? And, and individuals like Lee Richardson, who was doing research in the Eastern United States said, oh, yeah, we're also seeing declines in, in the yellow-banded bumblebee, Bombus tricola, and, and Bombus affinis, um, the rusty patch bumblebee, which, as Leif mentioned, is now listed as an endangered species, uh, as, are, as is Franklin's bumblebee in, in Northern California and Southern Oregon. And so this really mobilized the conservation community to say, hey, we, we need to start looking at, at this issue at a fairly broad scale. And at that time, um, the Xerces Society partnered with a number of other organizations, including Paul Williams at the Natural History Museum in London um, and some folks at the St. Louis Zoo to form the Bumblebee Specialist Group. And um, at that time, we, we gathered a network of around 75 bumblebee experts from all over the world. And um, the goal of this group is to assess the extinction risk or, or, or conservation status of all bumblebees in the world. And every colored um, country or, or continent that you see here, um, that's not colored gray, I suppose, if, we, if we're gonna consider gray a color, has native bumblebees. And so these are the regions where we're, we're looking to assess. There are about 250 species of bumblebees, or, or so far there are around 250 species of bumblebees. And so this is not a small task. To date, um, working with LEAF and a bunch of other scientists from, from the Western Hemisphere, we've actually assessed the extinction risk of, of bumblebees in the Western Hemisphere and, and drilling down a little bit closer into North America, we've looked at these species as well. So there's around 50 species of bumblebees in North America. And we're gonna throw a poll question at you right now. Um, given what um, 
you've sort of heard and maybe what your understanding is of, of bumblebees um, and their status. <clears throat> About how many bumblebee species in North America do you think are facing some degree of extinction risk? And I should be able to throw the poll up here so that you can actually see it. There we go. Um, so go ahead and, and cast your vote if you can see that. Looks like the numbers are starting to slow down a little bit here. So apparently I've painted a, a bit too grim of a picture of bumblebee status and, and that a lot of you, more than, more than half of you, um, thought that, that more than 25 species of bumblebees in North America um, are facing some degree of extinction risk. And that's not quite what we found. Um, what we see is, is really around 10 to 12 of these species um, are facing some degree of extinction risk. So it's around a quarter of, of the bumblebees in North America are facing some degree of extinction risk. Uh, okay. Um, and this is what that chart looks like if we sort of put it into a pie graph form um, of the bumblebees in North America. So around four of them are, are critically endangered. And these are all IUCN categories. Um, essentially what we, the, it's, it's a set of quantitative criteria that you plug in about each bumblebee and it's sort of, I don't want to say spits out because it's not quite that nuanced, but um, I, once you put in these quantitative measures of population and threats, um, different category are, categories are, are, are spit out. And, and so critically endangered is, is the worst extant um, option. So they're obviously extinct is, is one option on this list that's not listed here, but so four species in North America are critically endangered, two of them are endangered, five of them are vulnerable, um, and one of them is considered near threatened. And the rest of them are, are least concerned, seem to be okay. And this is an interesting sort of conundrum as a conservation biologist when you have some species that seem to be doing fine and actually increasing in numbers while you have others that seem to be declining fairly rapidly. So what's the difference in their biology or their threats that's leading to these differences. And we're still trying to piece that together. Um, when we step out and look more broadly um, at the world, um, you can see we've, we've assessed those in, in, in Mesoamerica as well as in South America. Um, but generally speaking, when we look at the areas that have been assessed, which includes Europe and the Western hemisphere, around a quarter of the bumblebees seem to be facing some degree of extinction risk. And when we look at the species in North America, these are sort of the 10 most imperiled species. We as a community are trying to figure out how do we prioritize conservation? Which of these species deserve our attention and what attention should they be getting? Um, and one of those steps has been to seek endangered species protection for these animals. And um, six of them have have been petitioned um, for endangered species listing. And two of them have been formally listed on the Endangered Species Act. And a few of them are in process. Um, and one species, the, the yellow-banded bumblebee, Bombus tricola, has been um, determined that it's not warranted. It, it's, its species was, was declared as though it was stable or the, the population was stable. But there's a number of them that have been. And this obviously puts a lot of conservation measures in place. Um, and allows us to do additional research on, on what's going on. So for example, with the rusty patch bumblebee, which was listed in 2016 or 2017, I think it was 2017. Um, since then, there have been a number of scientists that are doing detailed research on the nesting biology for this species and trying to define what a healthy population looks like and trying to determine what are the habitat characteristics that are contributing to this? What are the important plants? So, so endangered species listing, while it's important from a protection, it also brings a lot of attention on that species. And we're hoping that you know, these endangered species petitions and such will, will further conservation. In California, there were four species that were petitioned for California Endangered Species Act protection. 
um, Bombus crotchedii, the western bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis, Franklin's bumblebee, and Bombus sucklii, the suckly cuckoo bumblebee. And this petition was actually submitted by the Xerces Society a few years ago to, to, um, to seek state level protection for these bumblebees. This is a, a complicated conservation story that probably we could spend a half hour talking about in and of itself. Um, but it, this is in the courts basically right now is where I will leave it. Um, and under, uh, so the California Department of Fish and Wildlife also has what's called the State Wildlife Action Plan. And in that State Wildlife Action Plan, they name species of greatest conservation need, what are, we'll refer to as SGCNs. Um, and so in the California State Wildlife Action Plan or SWAP, there are six bumblebee species of greatest conservation need. In addition to the four species I just mentioned that have been petitioned for, for California Endangered Species Act protection, we add Bombus polygenosis, the fog belt bumblebee, and uh, Morrison's bumblebee, Bombus morrisoni, to the list that are, that are on the species of greatest conservation need. And again, putting them as species of greatest conservation need is, is akin to sort of uh, making conservation dollars available for the protection of these species. And so you may be asking yourself, well, why? What, what is going on with um, these particular species? Why are some of them in decline while others of, of, of them are, are doing just fine? The reality is, is that there's no you know, single reason for this. The, the world is a, a soup of threats. <laughs> um, and this is a, a good cartoon that, that shows that to a certain degree that, that you know, while bumblebees are trying to go about their business, we're reducing their food supply. We're throwing pesticides at them. They have this unique genetic makeup that we haven't really talked about that make them uniquely susceptible to inbreeding depression. There's diseases that we're throwing at them through commercial bumblebees and, and all of these other things. And I'm gonna go a little bit into detail about all of these individual threats, but I think it's important to recognize that there's no, there's probably no single threat alone that's leading to this. It's the combination of these threats working in concert um, that, are, that are really causing these threats. And, and, and so I titled this slide, How Strong is the Camel's Back? With this idea of, you know, we, we've all heard this is the straw that broke the camel's back. So if we start throwing all these threats at bumblebees and then say, throw an additional one like climate change at them, you know, how long can they sustain themselves? Um, and another way to think about this, if you've studied ecology, is to think about what's called an, an extinction debt. So these animals are hanging on and potentially at the last minute, we could just see a, a catastrophic you know, collapse of them. And you know, these are the major threats that we sort of see as, as contributing to declines in, in, um, in invertebrates and, and bumblebees in particular. So things like pollution, pesticides, um, nitrogen, nitrogenization of, of different areas, you know, urban areas, um, invasive species, um, climate change and habit loss and pesticides. And we're gonna take a closer look at all of these. Um, so habitat loss is a, is a big one. We've taken grasslands and prairies, which once provided you know, flowering resources from early spring through the end of, of uh, a late summer, long enough to sustain these long-term colonies that Leaf mentioned um, in his, you know, in his um, module when he was talking about the life cycle. Remember, it takes five weeks from egg to, to winged adult. So you know, we're talking a period of at least 10 weeks or so that a bumblebee you know, colony needs food in order to reproduce. And grasslands and prairies used to provide these, um, but we've converted our grasslands and prairies into farm fields for the most, most part. And while farm fields do provide or can provide flowering resources, instead of 10 weeks of flowering resources, they're providing you know, maybe two or three weeks of flowering resources, which just isn't long enough. Um, to sustain a bumblebee colony and, and give it the chance to reproduce. We're also obviously taking you know, brownfields and, and edge of, edges of cities and converting those into housing developments. And when we take you know, a, a grassland or, or even a remnant um, uh, riparian area and convert that into a, a suburban area that's filled with green grass or turf grass, you know, we're taking pretty valuable habitat and converting it into uh, habitat that really doesn't sustain any native species at all. Turf grass, while it may look neat and, um, and well-kept, it, it really doesn't sustain animals of any sort. And, and, and a lot of 
people also put a lot of chemicals on, on turf grass, which obviously isn't helping our, our native animals either. In addition to habitat loss, we've also started using some fairly toxic chemicals throughout the United States. Um, a question was asked in, uh, in LEAF's module about neonicotinoids and, and whether they've been studied on California bumblebees. This map here, while it, <laughs> it is moving very quickly on you and hopefully not causing you any harm, there it finally stopped, was showing um, the increase of use of one of these chemicals. This is called the midacloprid and it is a systemic neonicotinoid that when it's applied to the plant, it's actually expressed in every cell of the plant. So in addition to being sort of in the leaves and protecting that plant from potentially being eaten by an herbivore um, insect, it also gets into the pollen and into the nectar. So every time a, a bee drinks nectar or eats pollen, which you now know are the only sources of food for these animals, it's getting a micro dose of an insecticide. And oftentimes it may not be a lethal dose, so it may not cause them to fall off of the plant and die, but it causes what we call sublethal effects and changes their ability to navigate, changes their ability to effectively forage and efficiently forage, and in the long run, you know, can lead to population declines um, slowly. You know, not, it's not killing colonies necessarily, although it can do that as well. But, but certainly over the long term, slowly causing populations to decline. And some people think about this and they, uh, they just wanna point their finger at, at farmers and say, well, gosh, farmers need to stop using pesticides. But the reality of this is it's not just an agricultural problem. In fact, when we look at um, stream, if we look at streams in agricultural areas and suburban areas, we often find higher concentrations of these chemicals in urban and suburban streams than we do in agricultural fields. And there's a reason for that in that, you know, farmers have an economic threshold for using these chemicals to a certain degree, and they're also trained in these matters. So they learn how to use, in theory at least, the, the least concentrated um, dose that's going to be effective. But we as homeowners can go to big box stores or other places and buy these exact same chemicals, sometimes at much higher concentrations, with zero training. <laughs> and, and oftentimes homeowners, you know, will just spray this chemical every year or every couple of weeks um, and with the notion that sort of more must be better. And when we take sort of this education piece out of the use of insecticides, it's concerning. And um, as you can see here, this is this chart here just looks at sort of the, um, the user expenditures on pesticides in the United States. And you can see that home and garden use actually brings in more dollars than agricultural does um, of the chemicals that they're using or that they assessed in, in this paper. So this is certainly not just an agricultural problem. It's also an urban and suburban problem. And as an example, these are actually photos that I took in, in Oregon in 2014. Um, there's a bunch of European linden trees in a, in a parking lot in Oregon that were sprayed with a product called Safari, which is a, a neonicotinoid or the active ingredient is denoted furon. And um, all the black dots that you can see uh, underneath that tree are, are bumblebees. And so if we sort of zoom in and see what that looks like in that parking space, there are just hundreds if not thousands of dead bumblebees that were literally raining out of this tree as I stood here taking these pictures um, and you know, dial down a little bit deeper. And you know, there were 70 of these trees or about 70 of these trees in this parking lot. And when we sort of assessed the, the scale of, of loss, it was somewhere between 50 and 100,000 bumblebees died on this individual day. <laughs> um, and it was it, so you know, population level effect uh, uh, in decline happening. And if this happens in somebody's backyard and grass and not on a parking lot, we probably never would have noticed, right? So, so this, and it seems like every year we're getting, you know, increased notifications that events like this are happening. And so there's a lot of uncertainty here um, with neonicotinoids and insecticides. And part of the problem is that most, and the question that was asked you know, during LEAF's module about whether this has been studied on California bumblebees is a really apt question because most model studies for these chemicals from the EPA and other areas use honeybees as a proxy for our native bees. But hopefully, as you learned in LEAF's ecology module, our native bees do not have the same biology as honeybees. 
They don't live in boxes. They can't be moved around. Most of them are nesting directly in the ground. Um, and so when we're studying the effects of, of these chemicals on honeybees, we can look at direct contact and indirect contact and, and potentially indirect via the systemic methods. But we have no idea what the effects of contaminated nest materials. Remember that picture that Leaf showed you of the mega kailu day that was bringing that leaf back to its nest to line the nest and, and create a partition? What are the effects if that's treated with, or when that's a, a, you know, treated with any nicotinoid? What happens when neonicotinoids are running through the soil and are going right directly through our bee nests? We don't know this because they're not studied. And so this is a major factor in, in the long-term health uh, of bumblebees that we need to think about and consider. In addition to, to, to habitat loss and, and, and chemicals, um, climate change is, is disrupting our systems. It's causing meadows to dry out earlier. It's calling them, causing mismatches between flowering times and bee emergence times. Um, and, and, and this could have long-term impacts as well. Uh, throw on top of this disease, which has largely, we've learned, been, been amplified and spread through commercial bees, including commercial bumblebees and the European honeybee. Um, and this has been implicated in, in the decline of those four species that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. Um, so, so the rusty patch bumblebee, the yellow banded bumblebee, the western bumblebee, and Franklin's bumblebee all seem to have undergone this dramatic decline because of, because of disease. Um, and now, while disease may have been the cause of the initial decline, it's all of these other threats that may be inhibiting recovery if the, if the decline due to the disease has indeed stopped. And these diseases, we believe, were, were started from, from commercial bumblebees. So bumblebees are actually available for purchase, as we've mentioned, and they're often used in greenhouses. Uh, sometimes they're also used for open field pollination, although um, that's illegal in the state of California, at least for non-native species. So hopefully it isn't happening too much there. Um, but, but greenhouses aren't sealed. <laughs> you know, bumblebees can fly in and out of the vents and in and out of windows. And, and there's, lots of, there's plenty of studies that show that, that close to greenhouses, there's increased amounts of, of some of these pathogens. Um, and studies that are, have done by, by Sydney Cameron and her colleagues show that that, that commercial bumblebees very likely amplified and spread these pathogens to our wild bees all over North America. Um, and this just isn't happening in North America either. On pretty much every continent that we have native bumblebees, there's a similar thing happening where a commercial bumblebee has escaped and it's affecting the native fauna. This is happening in Japan, in Europe, in South America, um, and all over North America. And there's some uncertainty here. We don't have any sort of cause and effect studies, we can't go back in time and see why bumblebees decline. We have to use sort of these correlative, correlative studies, um, but this is what we've done. This is the paper I mentioned by Sydney Cameron that looks at sort of in the, in the mid 90s, we start to see a vast increase in the incidence of this pathogen, um, Nocebi, Nocema bombi, um, in species that are in decline and less so in species that, that seem to be more stable. And so again, um, you know, it's not just every, uh, it's not just these individual threats, but the interaction of these things together that are really probably leading to some of these declines, particularly for, for some of these super imperiled species. So, you know, poor nutrition in and of itself is one thing. You throw on top of that insecticide and fungicide exposure, and all of a sudden, you know, we, we know that when we have poor nutrition, our immune systems don't work as well. The same is true for, for bumblebees and, and other fauna. So, um, hopefully this makes sense. Okay, we've now reached the nadir of our presentation and you're sufficiently depressed <laughs> about the status of the world. Um, I'm now going to hopefully uplift you with some, some information about things that we're doing to hopefully make things better. Um, we believe that despite all these unknowns we've talked about, there's enough evidence out there to indicate that we need to start acting and we need to do something now. It might mean that we don't do the best things first. It might mean that we make mistakes. But ultimately, we all know that extinction is forever. And if we don't start acting now, there is a significant chance that we will lose species of bumblebees and other pollinators. And so one of the things that we've done um, about a, well, close to a decade ago now, I wrote this book called Conserving Bumblebees. And the purpose of this book was to give to land managers to help them identify threats and to manage lands better to help our bumblebees recover. 
part of the reason that we're doing these Atlas projects is to improve the recommendations in this book, to make them more evidence-based so we can learn more about which habitats are important and how to maintain them. So we can learn more about which plants are important for these imperiled species and put more of them on the landscape so that we can learn more about where they nest and where they over overwinter. So that in addition to just putting flowers on the landscape, we can also protect overwintering and nesting sites. Essentially, bumblebee habitat means four things. They need food, they need shelter, a place to build their nest and a place to overwinter. They need these things to be connected in the landscape through corridors, through islands in some way. And they need to have a reduced amount of pesticides so that these habitats are actually safe for them. These are the four components that are necessary for bumblebee health. Um, significantly, I think Leif mentioned this, I've now talked about it. Overwintering is a vastly overlooked portion of the bumblebee's life cycle, but it represents half of their time on the landscape and they're very um, vulnerable in this period because it's just a single bee in the ground overwintering. And so we know very little about this, but yet there are very few conservation measures in place for this. So we need to think more about our overwintering bumblebees and how we protect them when there aren't flowers on the ground and we can't detect them flying from flower to flower. When we think about pesticides on the landscape, instead of you know, always reaching for that bottle of, of, of neonicotinoid or systemic pesticide, we really encourage you to, to, to use a, a systems approach. If you have a pest in your garden, it isn't because you're, you haven't been applying pesticides. It's because there's some component of your garden that's out of whack. And so think about this as a gardener in terms of what am I missing? What do I need to add? Have I put something here that doesn't belong? And if, when you farm in a system way, you're sort of creating an ecology that functions in and of itself. And when you have a, a functional ecology in your backyard, you don't need chemicals. You know, like nature doesn't use chemicals. It, it functions because we create the components of that habitat that bring all the plants and animals in that make a functional ecosystem. And that's how we encourage you to approach, you know, gardens in, in a great way to reduce the, the, the amount of chemicals that we're using. Um, we also need to think about these diseases. So, so we need to stop the spread of these diseases and protect our native bumblebees. This is a fairly unregulated industry at this point. Bumblebees are moved throughout North America. They're not tracked. Um, and as I said, they're flying in and out of greenhouses that are also not effectively screened and closed off for them. So we need to do a better job here. Another thing we need to do, I didn't, haven't talked in depth about this, but there's fairly good evidence that honeybees compete with and also can spread diseases to our native bees, including bumblebees. And so we need to make sure to keep honeybees out of our natural areas where these are the last refuges for our native bees. And if all of a sudden we start bringing large quantities of honeybees in there, they stop being refuges. All of a sudden they, they experience competition where they have to use different plants and um, can be susceptible to disease as well. And just to sort of further hammer this home, like honeybees, while they're wonderful animals and they do provide honey and, and they're beautiful animals. I, I love honeybees. They're really spectacular creatures. You can learn a lot from them. You can get honey by keeping them, but I just think it's important for you to recognize that keeping honeybees is not conservation. Keeping honeybees is a hobby. Um, and it, it, you know, saying that keeping bees is, is conservation is kind of like saying, oh, I have chickens in my backyard. I'm helping to save the birds. <laughs> this isn't true, right? We're not, we're not doing this, but keeping chickens is great. You can, you can have meat if you eat meat or, or eggs, and you can learn from them and enjoy them. And that's a great reason to keep chickens. It's also a great reason to keep bees. But, but, I'm, but I'm just saying, don't become a beekeeper in the name of conservation, because it really isn't conservation. Um, habitat is, is conservation, and that's where we should be focusing things. We also need to be thinking about climate change at local and landscape and government and industry scales. This is a huge thing that we just can't stop talking about or thinking about. And I, I feel silly that I'm gonna give this 10 seconds on the slide, but we really do need to be thinking about climate change. Um, and lastly, you know, one of the things that Xerces is doing is launching these Atlas projects to try to gather more information so that we can make better um, management recommendations to improve things for bumblebees in the future. So we're now in the Pacific Northwest, 
we're in Nebraska, we're in Missouri, we're now in California. Thank you for being here. We're also in Minnesota, and next year in 2022, we're also going to be in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Kansas. So phenomenal partnerships between Xerces and state partners and other nonprofits um, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM, and all these fantastic partners are getting on board because they recognize the deficit in our understanding and that more understanding will become better conservation. So hopefully that helps lay the groundwork for why we're doing this project. Um, Leaf, I think I went probably about five minutes over there, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions if we have time or whatever. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. That's great. Uh, so yes, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, the first one, I'll combine two questions from participants about honeybees. Um, the first uh, is how much co cooperation has the Xerces Society been able to get from beekeeping societies and associations in California? with help with pesticides and observations of bee species. Um, and that person is an apprentice beekeeper themselves. Uh, and the second question is, uh, is how do I keep honeybees out of my yard? Are they coming from nearby farms? Um, great, qu great questions. Uh, the first one's a, a really big one. I, I don't, um, this is not, this is a controversial issue, right? So, so, and I and I mean that in that um, we're, we're we've taken a fairly strong position in our belief that that our native species should be protected, and we feel very strongly about that. Nevertheless, when we step back and look at the larger landscape, the issues facing honeybees are very similar to the issues facing native bees, and there are lots of opportunities for us to collaborate on conservation measures. Um, we can work together to reduce pesticides, and we are working together to reduce pesticides. We can work together to create better forage on the landscape, and we are working better. Like all the work that Xerces does, I don't know how many acres of habitat that Xerces has put on the ground in California on farms, but every acre that we put on in the name of native bees, and it's not only in the name of native bees, also benefits honey. Hey, Rich, uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but you're sharing your inbox right now. Oh. Thank you. I, I, oh, stop share. There we go. Thank there you. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, you know, all that Xerces does benefits, benefits honeybee conservation, native bee conservation. And, um, and so, sorry, I'm super distracted by that. I'm, I'm embarrassed, but it is what it is. And we'll just move on. <laughs> Um, in terms of how do you get honeybees out of your backyard, I, I don't think you can. Um, but I think it, it's very likely they are coming from uh, a neighbor that's keeping bees, whether that's a farm or, or a suburban yard is, is hard to say. But I think the important thing is, is, is for us to be educating our neighbors and our, and our friends and saying that if you're going to keep honeybees, that's a fine thing to do, no problem, keep honeybees but you should also be creating habitat. You know, like a honeybee hive needs probably close to a half acre of habitat. And so if you're keeping honeybees in your yard, I hope you don't have green grass. You know, hopefully you've got gardens of flowers. And I think as long as we can work together and recognize that, 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 um, that habitat is really the answer to honeybee and native bee conservation, then, then we can do great things together. Great, thanks. Let's have you answer one more quick one. Uh, there are lots of questions, but we'll need to move on. So this was a question about fire. Uh, this participant is asking, since bumblebees nest in the ground, does fire harm them? So if you could comment generally about how wildfire and other forms of fire might impact bumblebees, I think that's really relevant to Californians. Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. Um, and there's no, as with, everything else. There's no single answer. The, the, the effects on bumblebees and other pollinators is really going to depend on the fire. Um, you can have a, a, you know, a quick fire that would go through and, and clear brush and, and burn at fairly low temperatures. And a fire like this might be mostly beneficial for bumblebees. It, it would you know, create early cereal habitat, allow a flush of wildflowers, um, and provide great habitat and likely not burn deep enough to affect nests that were under the surface of the ground. You can also get these catastrophic wildfires that are burning at 
intensely high temperatures, they're sterilizing the soil, they're burning, you know, at high temperatures deep down in the ground. These are going to wipe out overwintering bees, they're going to wipe out nests, and they sterilize the soil such that, you know, wildflowers aren't going to return for a number of years. Um, and so, and then you can get everything in, in between there. I think ultimately, you know, as long as one of the benefits of bumblebees that they have a benefit, I think, over other species is that they are fairly mobile. They can fly long distances. And so even if an area, you know, experiences an intense wildfire fire that potentially extirpates, you know, bumblebees from an area, the chances of them recolonizing that area because of their long flight distances and dispersal distances is pretty good. Um, you know, something like a grass skipper butterfly, that's a different story, you know, where their entire life is, is probably mediated by about 200 square meters. So this really varies, I think, by the taxa that we're looking at, as well as for, um, by the intensity of the fire and, and the landscape that was there before. One thing important to keep in mind here, though, is because different bumblebees are in different conservation statuses, this isn't necessarily a great thing for all species of bumblebees. You know, if you think about something that's fairly rare in California, like the Western bumblebee, if you have an intense fire that wipes out a significant population, you know, the chances of them recolonizing that are just smaller because there's fewer populations to repopulate that area. So, um, yeah, we need to do a better job managing our forests to try to reduce these intense fires and, and try to keep them as beneficial as we possibly can.